Welcome to part one of a two-part webinar. Let me give you a little bit of the uh, background how this uh, came to be. Uh, my friend Ellie Nash made a uh, webinar a couple weeks ago, which was a panel, and it was about the, uh, it was entitled The Great Divide, which some people felt was a very uh, provocative title, and it was meant to be a provocative title. Um, and it was about parents uh, who are religious and their children who have <clears throat> chosen a different path than the ones the, the, than the path that their, their parents raised them. Um, I got tremendous feedback from that panel. And uh, afterwards, I was speaking to Ellie about it. And Ellie is always one of my good advisors. He said, I think you need to do a follow up. And he said, why don't you do one session, what every parent needs to know about this sugya, about this topic, and then the mirror image, so to speak, a, uh, a session, what every child needs to know who's in this, uh, in this situation. And let everybody come to both or, or either, whichever they prefer, or uh, whatever, you know, wherever they feel they fit in or wherever they're curious. So I'm cognizant of the fact that um, although tonight's lecture is officially titled What Every Parent Needs to Know, not everyone listening here is a parent, or even if you're a parent, maybe you're not on the parent side of this subject, maybe you're the child, or maybe you're just a concerned spectator or a friend or a family member. So, and that's fine because this is a subject that is so big that it affects all of us. And uh, I think everybody can uh, do well to commit some time into understanding this topic a little bit better. However, I'm going to address my words directly to parents who are in this, uh, who are in this situation. And uh, if you're not a parent, or if you're not a parent in this situation, just please understand that, um, you know, take what you can from it that you can apply to your situation. But the, the way I'm going to speak is to the parents. So you are a parent who raised your child to be religious like you, or probably even your hopes were that they would be more religious than you, right? The Gemara says that no one will ever be jealous of their Talmud or of their child because the whole role of a parent or a teacher is to uh, facilitate the growth of our children and students until they even surpass us, right? That's the greatest nachas. And uh, whatever happened, whenever it happened, however it happened, you came to a point where you see that your child is not interested in Yiddishkeit the way that you wanted them to be whatever that means. And there are so many different versions of this story. Um, I would not want to even attempt to uh, generalize and, and, and you know, create a uh, hypothetical scenario, but let's just speak in very, very broad terms. You, the parent, raised your child to follow in a certain path in regards to Yiddishkeit and they are not on that path. Okay, fine. The question is now, what do you do? What do you do? So I'm going to tell you my whole talk in one minute. This is the most important piece of information that I have to share with parents in this situation. In fact, with, with, with all parents and any parents. And this is it. I'm going to say it right up front. This applies to every situation, but especially in a situation like this, where there's desperation and there's fear and there's this, this, this focus on, on solving the problem and getting to the bottom of it and you know, all that type of uh, panicked thinking and, and disappointment, frustration. So here, here, here's my message to you. What a thousand professionals 
therapists, teachers, whoever. Put them all together. The greatest team ever assembled in the world. What a thousand of them can accomplish for your child will never come close to what one loving parent can do for a child. That's it. There is nothing like the unconditional love and support from a parent, from a parent to a child. You can question that. You can ask me, why is that? Why did Hashem set it up that way? But I'm just telling you in the one minute version of this talk, the greatest power you have in fact, no one wields this power in your child's life the way you do, if you so choose to wield this power. The greatest power you have is your connection, your bond, your loving, supportive, unconditional relationship with your child. And that is the medicine that makes all other healing possible. Without it, a very, very, very driven uh, person can succeed in spite of not receiving that kind of support from a parent, but it makes it so much harder. With it, with the, the, with, with the, 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 the parental support, the healing can begin and the sky's the limit. All possibilities are, are open. So that's it. That's the one minute talk. Now that I said that, I want to state a caveat, a condition. Um, because this caveat, if you, if you don't know this, then you don't know that um, there's something that can undo everything I just said. And that is... when we're talking about unconditional love and the power of unconditional love, if you use your unconditional love to get a result, then it's not unconditional. So you have the power to enable your child to accomplish anything if you are truly just loving them without the intent even the the in the back of your mind that by giving th th this love they're going to do something that you want them to do even if even if your pnea your ulterior motive is, is for their benefit the thing that you want them to do isn't even for you it's for them right because when you love somebody in order to produce a result that's not unconditional love so here's the double bind. Here's the paradox. The only way out of this, this uh, situation is love. But if you use love as the way to get out of a situation, then you're not really loving. And that's what's so difficult. What's so difficult is to accept your child as they are right now, even when you're unhappy with where they're at in life. And maybe even they are unhappy. They probably are unhappy with where they're at in life. But to completely accept them and to be proud of them, we're going to talk about that in a, in a moment, being proud of a child who's not living up to what your plans were for them. Because it's very important, not just to love them, but to be proud of them. But we'll talk about that. I want to I get to that in a minute. So the, the paradox is to love without any expectations. Even though you realize now that love is the most powerful tool that you have. You know, I get a lot of questions from people. I think this is 
this is bound to come up in the Q&A and I'll just put it out right, right in the beginning. People often ask about uh, tough love. They call it tough love, or sometimes they say, uh, they say it in a negative way, what they don't wanna be. I don't wanna be a codependent. I don't wanna be an enabler. And they have been taught that you have to have boundaries and you have to, uh, you have to be tough on the kids, right? Okay. And first of all, let me preface my answer by saying that I'm a big advocate of 12-step work. Uh, I think I've established my record on that, on that issue. Um, and when people ask me, well, how do you reconcile unconditional love with boundaries? My answer is, it's not a contradiction at all if you understand both of these ideas properly. Let me try to explain to you what, and, and if this isn't your question, that's fine. You can just sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, check your emails or something during this, during this section. But a lot of people do have this question. I don't want to be an enabler. I don't want to be a codependent. So let me tell you something. Um, it, you're right. It is sick to be an enabler and to be a codependent. And that's why in the world of recovery, uh, people who have that problem go into recovery themselves, right? We learned that it's a family disease. So it's not just the addict needs recovery. The codependent needs recovery too, right? So like in Al-Anon, let's say, for friends, of fam friends and family of alcoholics, they work the same 12 steps as the alcoholics work. Because what happens is they realize that, you know, the addict is addicted to their, you know, uh, drug of choice. The codependent is addicted to the addict. And that's a real insidious addiction is being addicted to people uh, because, you know, you have such a, a holy and righteous cover story when you're addicted to people, um, especially if you're a Jewish parent. Uh, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm not controlling. I'm not manipulating. I'm not overly enmeshed. I am uh, I'm just doing my job. I'm, I, I just, I'm trying to take care of my children. I just love them, right? And what we have to learn is that the attachment to results, meaning we use manipulation, we use um, <clears throat> emotional blackmail to try to get people to do what we desperately want them to do, right? So if I only um, give in to my child and uh, you know, buy them that thing that they want me to buy them, um, then when I tell them you better be home at 11, they'll really be home at 11. And that's insanity. That's insanity. And the recovery from codependence is to realize that you can't control your loved one. And you have to let go of that control. And because this is a faith-based uh, approach, we understand that letting go doesn't mean, doesn't mean abandonment, but rather letting go means releasing them to the care of God. Somebody once explained it to me that, uh, you know, for a codependent, the most important thing is to detach. Detach. So Rosh it's uh, an acronym. Don't even try and change him or her. Detach. Don't even try and change him. So really the recovery approach, um, the not being a codependent, not being an enabler, means to detach. Don't even try and change him. Stop it. Stop trying to use, you know, if the, the, the codependent behavior is, you know, if I, if I beg you, if I plead with you, if I use uh, guilt, you know, how can you do this to your mother? You're keeping us up all night, right? Or if I use, uh, you know, sweet talking, oh, sweetheart, you know, we, you know, we love you so much. 
And of course, you will uh, stop doing that uh, destructive behavior, right? Or you spying. That's a, you know another big one. You know, and you, you check their cell phone, you go through the drawer, go through their pockets. You know, all the insanity, all the insanity. And and you know, the recovery from that is to realize you can't control a, 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 another human being, and you got to let go of that. And real recovery from that, what happens is you realize that um, I can't play God in somebody else's life. You can't play God. Now, here's the thing. The way that that often plays out, the way that it often looks, is... um, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Nothing I can do for you. You know, go help yourself. That's the way the detachment looks. But it doesn't have to look that way. You see, what was toxic wasn't the fact that you were giving to people. If you're a codependent, a people pleaser, they're also called. What was toxic wasn't that you were giving to people. What was, what was toxic was that you had this unspoken narrative in your mind that you believed in, that when you give to people, you can control them. That when, if you'll just be sweet enough, if you'll just be, you'll just ingratiate yourself enough, you'll win their loyalty and they'll stop breaking your heart. And that's the insanity. So the freedom from being a people pleaser, the freedom from being a uh, codependent, the freedom from being an enabler is that I stop using this controlling behavior. And I am free to be loving and giving with no expectation whatsoever. I no longer use love and generosity as a secret weapon. So why be loving? Why be generous? Why be giving? If I'm not going to get anything out of it, (laughs) why? Because it's God-like. Because just as he is compassionate, you should be compassionate. Just as he is gracious, you should be gracious. And I don't have to expect anything from it. So, Recovery from codependence and unconditional love actually are not only uh, two things that can be reconciled with each other, but to me, they're synonymous. They look identical. I just want to make this clear. I'm repeating myself, but I'm going to repeat it in slightly different words. When somebody uh, stops being a people pleaser, a codependent, an enabler, they, they, oftentimes they make the mistake by, this, by saying, you know, I, I was just too sweet. I was too giving. Giving is toxic for me. I'm just, I, have to, I have to be tough. No more Mr. Nice Guy, okay? Because giving is toxic for me. That's a misunderstanding of the whole parsha. It wasn't the giving that was toxic. It was giving in order to get control over people. That was toxic. But if you can trust God enough to let go of your need to control other people and realize that they have their own relationship with God, to realize that God has no grandchildren and your child isn't God's grandchild, you understand? Just because you're God's child and your child is your child doesn't mean your child is God's grandchild. Your child is God's child directly. Your child has a direct relationship with Hashem. And you don't have to be there. You don't have to stand between them and Hashem. And you don't have to play God. You can be God-like in being gracious and compassionate, but you don't have to be the one who tries to play God by making sure that they're at home, they're, they're at home the time that you tell them to be at and that they're not hanging around with the wrong people and that they're uh, making good on their promises and they're living up to their responsibilities. Not your job. Not your job. And as long as you're using sweetness and presence to win over anyone, including your child, especially a child, um, in order to, to be able to sleep at night, right? Well, he wouldn't break my heart tonight because I just bought him a car, right? Okay. So that's the insanity of the codependent. But when you stop 
being a codependent. Now the beautiful thing is you can give for fun and for free. You can give without any expectation of any payoff. And that's why I say unconditional love is not a stira with uh, recovery from codependence. And in my mind, not only they're not contradictory, they are synonymous. They, they look identical. And the way they look is a healthy person who's connected to God and gets their needs met through God is no longer trying to get their needs met through other people or through security to get their security through other people's behaviors. And now when they are kind and loving and sweet, there's no expectation of anything, even being kind and loving and sweet to your struggling child who you want to see certain behaviors from, you're not even going to do, you're not even that pnea, you're not going to have. So to go back to where I started from, the greatest power that a parent has is love. But the minute you start to realize, oh, it's powerful, I could get some results from that love, ah, now you spoiled it. Now you spoiled it. Okay, so far so good. Makes sense so far. I mean, I don't. I, I'm not asking you if you agree with me. That I, that might take time, or maybe you'll never agree with me, which is also fine because you're entitled to a, your own opinion. But I'm just asking cognitively. This logic makes sense. Not that, not if you agree with, me, but just you understand at least the the logic is is internally consistent, right? Okay. Not easy, but makes sense. Okay, that's what somebody wrote in the in the chat. Yeah, it's not easy. It's very hard. It's very hard because you have to overcome the temptation of using your love manipulatively. And children know, everyone knows, but especially children know when they're being manipulated. Now, let me dig a little deeper. Let me dig a little deeper. I didn't even speak about the story of the child. And I said before, there are so many different versions of the story. It's very hard to um, make a general scenario. But let me say this. I do not believe that it happens anymore, that somebody reads a pamphlet from the Maskilim and decides to run away from the shtetl and go to the university and uh, live like a non-Jew. I, I think the last time that probably happened was 100 years ago. I don't think that's what happened today. Today, when children leave Yiddishkeit, anecdotally, I'm, I'm reporting. So don't ask me for numbers. I don't have studies. It's not my job. I'm just telling you from the hundreds of real life situations that I've ever been involved in, there's always, I'm gonna use a word now that evokes very strong reactions, but there is always trauma. Now, I have to explain what trauma means. And for a longer explanation of this, just Sunday night, for two hours, I was on a, uh, a show, the Let's Get Real show with Coach uh, Menachem Bernfeld and, uh, and uh, Ashi Parnas. And we spoke about for two hours. I brought uh, Reb Shimon Russell on with me. We spoke about trauma for two hours. So if you want uh, more on that, you can go check that out. Um, trauma could be the things that we know are traumatic, such as. Uh, Sexual abuse, that's a big one. It's much more rampant than we care to admit. Um, I'm not going to say a number because whatever number I say, either you won't believe it or you'll think, uh, I don't know, for some reason when I say these numbers, people suspect I have some type of ulterior motive in, 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 in like inflating the numbers. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's big. It's big. Okay. If it were one child, it would be too much. And it's much more significant than, than that. Um, so th that's an obvious trauma. And then, you know, and then there's, there's things like uh, you know, physical abuse, obviously, or, or uh, severe bullying, a child who was, who was bullied. Um, th these are things that you know, we all know of. 
Then there is, um, you know, what they call co complex trauma. Now, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not here to, you know, define these clinical terms. But the, the, the term they use, complex trauma, that means it's not a single event trauma. It's not that something cataclysmic happened in a child's life. It's sort of just the compound effect of thousands of little micro traumas. So, for instance, uh, a kid who has a learning disability and he's going to yeshiva where they can't really support that. And so he spends eight, nine, ten hours a day trapped in this box where he's not good at what he's supposed to be doing and he's disappointing everyone. And, uh, <laughs> you know, his self-esteem is taking a beating and, and, and he wants to be somewhere else and, and he's, he's trapped there. You know, that could cause trauma or, um, you know, even can just be the social pressure. The severe, I mean, I'll talk about this also. Uh, let, let me, let me, uh, let me remind myself to get back to this, the severe, severe social pressure of our community. Let's not, uh, you know, let's not mince words over here. Uh, living in any from community is living in a fishbowl and being scrutinized. And uh, there's definitely a, uh, a pressure that, that builds and that, that can be traumatizing. And especially if, if, if for, if for any reason, a child starts to deviate and then they're judged for deviating. And then the pressure of being judged leads them to deviate more, which then leads them to be judged even more harshly. And then obviously becomes a vicious cycle. Okay. And, and then there's another thing that I'll put out there, which is there are some people who are traumatized just by life itself. Um, I've had this theory for a long time. I, I wrote about it in, in God of Our Understanding about addiction. And now I've been you know, learning more about trauma because I've been involved with, uh, with Fresh Start uh, Retreat Center. And I've been speaking to some of the biggest experts in the world in this uh, topic. And anyone I've asked about this, they've agreed with me that there are sensitive souls. And it's interesting to see these doctors and these clinicians uh, who are coming from a, you know, a, a, a very secular background, at least their, their training, their professional training is. And, and I say, you know, what about the sensitive souls? And they instantly know what I'm talking about, right? So, you know, those are the, the poets, the artists, the creative types. And I don't mean literally poets and artists. Some of them are poets and artists, but, you know, the, 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 the sensitive types and, you know, a lot of times those are the kids with the sensory issues, like the tag in the back of the shirt's driving me crazy, or I can't eat because my brother is breathing funny through his nose. And like little stuff like that is just driving me crazy because I feel everything so acutely, so deeply, right? Okay. It's like a, the, a layer of skin that makes life functional was removed from me and now everything's touching my nerves, right? And, and, I say, as a rabbi, you know, I say that, that makes perfect sense that there are spiritual uh, canaries, I call them, you know, the canary in the coal mine. He dies from the same thing that the miners die from. He just dies first, right? It's an old expression about the canary in the coal mine. So there are sensitive souls who just feel things more deeply and for whom embodiment itself is disturbing. And who tell me, who's crazy? Are they crazy for thinking embodiment is disturbing? Of course it's disturbing. A soul is up there in heaven basking in, 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 in oneness, and then it comes down to a world of separation where now it's in a body and it's being categorized and it's being separated from, from others and separated from, from, from the revelation of godliness and everything's hidden and now it's bombarded with all these physical stimuli. Is that crazy that they should feel traumatized just by embodiment, just by being an Elam Haza Gashmi? Uh, that's the opposite of crazy. That's the most sane reaction. So these children, by and large, are traumatized. Um, so what we have to understand is this. How can you react with anger, disapproval, frustration towards someone who's passionate doing the best they can do? That's what I want you to understand. Your child is doing the best he can do or she can do. It takes every 
ounce of strength they can muster to get out of bed at 3 p.m., come downstairs, eat something, and go back to sleep. If that's how they're living now, that's about what they're able to do right now. And if Leia Lane, they had cancer, your neighbors would have sympathy for you and you would have sympathy for your child. Think of all of these children today as Holocaust survivors. The Satmarov once said, that if you see somebody with numbers on his arm putting on film, you could ask that person for a bracha, just like you can ask a tzaddik. Because anyone with numbers on his arm who's still putting on film is a tzaddik. Now, there are plenty of Holocaust survivors who don't put on film. Are you going to yell at them? Are you going to pressure them? Are you going to tell them you're disappointed in them? Or if the Holocaust survivor decides to come for two minutes to your Shabbos table, even knowing what triggers there may be at the Shabbos table, are you going to pressure them? Did, did you hear Kiddush? How are you eating? Did you hear Kiddush? Did, did, did you wash? I'm talking about an actual Holocaust survivor. A 90-year-old Holocaust survivor walks into your... You've asked him before, would you like to put on tefillin? If you're a Lubavitcher, you've asked him if he wants to put on tefillin. And he yelled at you, get away from me with your tefillin. And now he walks into your house and he stands there and he's looking at your Shabbos table. How are you going to react? Are you going to invite him to come sit with you? With not only with no pressure, but it's not even a have a minute. You wouldn't even think the pressure of this person. You'd be so impressed that he's overcoming whatever triggers he has, and he's standing at your Shabbos table. And you'd be out of him. What I'm telling you is you have to think of these children as Holocaust survivors. But in some way, I know I'm going to get nailed for saying this. <sighs> Their predicament is even more difficult than that of Holocaust survivors, because a Holocaust survivor, at the end of the day, you can say it was the Nazis. Somebody who grew up in our community and experienced life as trauma, for whatever reason, any of the reasons I mentioned or, or other reasons, his triggers aren't the Nazis. His triggers are everything associated with Yiddishkeit. And now you're going to judge him? You're going to pressure him? You're going to tell him that you're disappointed in him? So I want to just explain how inappropriate that response is. How terribly, terribly inappropriate that response is. And if it will be the 90-year-old Holocaust survivor, we would all agree how terribly inappropriate it is. You're going to go into a nursing home, find Holocaust survivors and, and, and harass them because they don't keep kosher? No one would be that cruel or, or disconnected from reality. So that's first of all. But second of all, let me explain something to you. One of the greatest traumas that all of these children have in common, whatever their original trauma was, what the, the one trauma that they all eventually experience in common is rejection. And the rejection can be worse than any of the other traumas. Knowing that you're a disappointment, knowing that somebody feels that they wasted tuition on you, knowing that the person who made you, that your own mother or father cringes when they see you, that kills, that kills, that's a stab in the heart. 
So what I'm trying to tell you is this. First of all, it's wildly inappropriate to express disdain toward the Holocaust survivor. But second of all, when you do that, when you express your disdain, even if you don't say it, you crinkle your nose, that's enough. That rejection is so painful that the, 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 the response to such a rejection is to go and engage in, what, in whatever numbing behaviors that the child has discovered to numb the trauma that they already have. So whatever it is that they're doing, whether it's chemicals or high-risk behavior or, or whatever it is, whatever they're involved in, the, 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 the adrenaline rush behavior that they're involved in, or the, the numbing behavior or the technology or the, 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 the other inappropriate things, I mean, let's say it, the, the, the children who are sitting in their room on Shabbos watching pornography on their smartphone. That is self-medicating behavior. That is numbing behavior. And when the child comes out of their room and you look at the child like, you're breaking my heart. They know that. They feel that. And that rejection is so painful, they have no choice but to go back to the numbing behaviors so that they don't have to feel that pain anymore. Now, how the heck are you going to not look at that child and not feel heartbroken and not feel disappointment? Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. And now I'm reminding myself to go back to something I said that I would get to. Remember, I said we would talk about it's not enough to have unconditional love. There has to be unconditional pride. Let's talk about that. How can you be proud of somebody no matter what? I understand loving them no matter what. How do you be proud of them no matter what? Unconditional nachas. Remember, a father told me a story. His 20-year-old son was home from yeshiva, home from yeshiva. He hadn't been in yeshiva for a couple of years. And at first it was, well, you can come home if you have a job. But the job didn't work out because he couldn't get up. And, uh, you know, this is a kid out of yeshiva. He's not working. He doesn't daven. You know, he hadn't touched his tefillin in, 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 in months. Locked in his room all Shabbos. Again, probably with the smartphone, probably looking at inappropriate stuff because, you know, that's, that's numbing behavior. And one day the father walks by the, the son's room and he looks at him and he says, how can, you, how can you be happy like this? And, and the father is expressing his own frustration. That he, you know, the son is wasting his life, right? Now, remember, I told you before, if your child, Leleno, was a cancer patient, your neighbors would have sympathy for you and you would have sympathy for your child, right? You wouldn't walk by the cancer patient child and say, how can you be happy living like this? Right? You, God forbid, you wouldn't say that, right? He comes by, he says, yeah, how can you be happy living like this? So the kid responds. Interesting how the kid responds. You're never proud of me. Father responds, how do I know this? The father told me this story. The father responds, it's not true. Uh, I was proud of you when you were a counselor at such and such. <laughs> that was three summers ago, right? So basically he's re reinforcing it even more. Like, no, what do you mean never proud of you? I was proud of you once, three years ago, right? Okay, rub it in even worse, right? kid says, are you proud of me now? Now, parents, for God's sake, if your child ever looks at you and asks you, are you proud of me now? I'm begging you. Okay, this father didn't know. I'm not judging his answer. But if your child ever asks you, are you proud of me now? The answer is yes. The answer is always yes. Now, how is it yes? I'll get to that. This father, he says to the son, no, I'm not proud of you. 
Look at you. What's there to be proud of? I said to this father, I said, you should have told him you're proud of him. He says, why should I lie to him? Why should I lie to him? Here's where we need a whole new understanding of everything. Told the father, um, Kol Yisro Yishlam Chelik Leilam Habo. Every Jew has a portion of the world to come. Shinema, like it says, the Amich Kulam Tzadikim. Your nation are all righteous. Kulam Tzadikim, Taket, really? They're all righteous. I don't see them behaving righteously all the time, all of them. No, you don't get it. That's not what we mean here. We're talking about, like the Pasuk continues, you might say, your dial, he's poet. Branch of my planting, work of my hands, to take pride in. Hashem says of the Jewish people and of every individual yid, this is what I made and I am proud. Lihispoer means to be proud. So I told this father, and I'm telling you, Hashem is proud of your child right now. Who are you not to be proud of them? And they're going to say, oh, but the, but it, it, I was created the servant maker. He's not serving his maker. First of all, you don't know how he's serving. You don't know how he's serving. You don't know the struggle that it takes him. That, 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 that one minute less that he's watching uh, dirty movies on, on Shabbos on his smartphone, it could take more struggle than it takes you to, uh, to, to, to dive in three times a day in a minion. So first of all, you don't know. But second of all, who says that the only type of nachas is based on what a person is doing? That's a very secondary type of nachas. Yeah, nachas ruach lefonai shamarti v'nasar etzayni. Yehuda says, I, uh, "It's pleasing to me that it, that you did what I said." But is that the only nachas? No. Much more basic than that, much more fundamental than that, is ma'ase yode lihis poet. That I am proud of the Jewish people just because I made them. And in fact, you can't have a legitimate nachas from. Their 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 maisim until you first have a foundation of nachas from just their etzim being. So I want to explain something to you. If this is really about Yiddishkeit, if this is really about Yiddishkeit, if this is really about Hashem, okay, if this is really about Torah Samus, then I'm going to tell you what is Yiddishkeit, Torah Samus, what is what what is what do they say? Your child is my Sayodai von Ebishtin. Please call To be proud of. So if you want to tell me you're not proud of him, okay, fine. Then admit that that's not based on Yiddishkeit. So you, you, you then, then own that. Then say, look, on an ego level, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. I'm frustrated. I worked hard. And this is what I got for it. I slaved to pay tuition. And, and, and this is the result. So I'm disappointed on an ego level. Fine, I give that to you. No problem. And, 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 and maybe you need emotional support to be able to work through that. But don't make this a Yiddishkeit issue because the Abishter is proud of your child. When the Abishter looks at the Holocaust survivor and that everything, after everything that happened to our people, a Jew still walks the face of this earth, whether he's from or he's not from. This, the etzim existence of the Yid is a testimony to the nitzchias of the Abishter. So you want to be from on me? Be real from. And look at your child and see your child is a neshama. Now what they do with that neshama? Okay, that, that, that's the next step. And of course there's an idea of, of having nachas from what they do. 
But don't jump to that until you have nachas just from, just from the fact that they exist. You know, when there's a child with special needs who's severely developmentally delayed and, and, and they can't do mitzvahs, but nobody's angry at them and no one's disappointed in them. And if, if they do any little thing, everybody has nachas. Why? Because it's easier when you see a child with, 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 with severe special needs, you understand that this is a neshama. So then you love them for who they are, not because of what they can do for you. But I want to tell you something. We're all neshamas. So because my special needs aren't as obvious as someone else's special needs, now the only way I get to have your pride is if I do something to earn your pride. Why can't you be proud of me like Hashem is proud of me? Just be proud of me because I exist. Just be proud of me because I exist. And so I told you when the child comes out of their room for those five minutes and you, uh, you look at them with horror and disgust, they know it and they feel it. And that rejection is a dagger in the heart. So how are you going to not have horror and disgust? You're going to have to be a rabbi. I'm sorry, you're going to have to be a rabbi. And being a rabbi means to look at every yid as a neshama. So instead of looking at their goof, you have to look at them as their eternal, flawless neshama. You have to see past the chitzenius. See past the chitzenius. See past the outer shell. See that there's a precious neshama. And that the value of that neshama is intrinsic. You know what I mean by intrinsic? Not extrinsic. The neshama doesn't have to earn its value. It doesn't have to do something to become valuable. It is intrinsically valuable. So the neshama has a value that is intrinsic. The neshama has a value, a value that is unconditional. Can't be taken away. The neshama has a value that is infinite. There's no limit. There's no end to the value of a neshama. So however proud you'll be of your child, it'll never be enough. Now, I want to talk about one more thing. Then I'll take a look at some of the q and I'll look at the, the chat. I want to talk about one more thing. I mentioned a couple things. I'm going to put them together. One is the uh, incredible pressure of living in a from community. I also mentioned a lot of times when parents claim that, uh, you know, they, they, they're, they're disappointed in their children and their, their, their reasoning is because, you know, because of Torah, right? Because it's a from cut to be disappointed in your child who's not from. So I want to tell you, and, and that, and that really that that's peer pressure. Not peer pressure from the children, peer pressure from the adults. The worst peer pressure is the parents get from each other, right? That you feel like a failure as a parent. You have to have the same family, or at least the appearances of the same family as your neighbor's family appears to be. You don't know what's going on in his house either. But. So I want to put those two together. And that the pressure of our culture and um, the the um, the fact that a lot of rejection of these children is because of parents who are, you know, embarrassed. <sighs> Please consider um, Please consider if you believe if you believe that Hashem really wants you to pressure and torture your child in the name of Yiddishkeit. Please ask yourself if you really think that's what Hashem wants from you. I don't know a Jew more religious than Meishe Rabbeinu. I don't know a Jew who followed Teira more than Meishe Rabbeinu. Teira is called Teiras Meishe. <laughs> Can't get uh, more closely associated to Taita than that. 
And when Hashem told Moshe that he's going to write off some Jews because of what they had done, Moshe said, no Erase me from your book. Because if this Torah doesn't have room for those Jews, it doesn't have room for me either. And I don't want to be included in such a religion. You know, <laughs> it's almost like Lev Yitzchak Berdichever told the atheist, the God you don't believe in is the same God I don't believe in, right? And Moshe said even more than that. He told, he told Hashem, he said, Hashem, if that's what you really believe, I'm sorry. I don't want you. I don't want your Torah. And of course, Hashem told Moshe, you're right. That's not what I believe either. And I'm glad I chose a guy like you. I saw when you were a shepherd, what kind of uh, leader you were, right? You want to be from? Torah says that we put Jews first, that we fight for them, we stand up for them, to be makat of them, to include them. So don't tell me that it's Avasa Torah when, when you're diminishing an Avas Yisro. Don't blame it on Hashem. Don't blame it on Torah. There's tremendous social pressure, understandably, and we could talk about that in another time. There's tremendous social pressure. I mean, I'm not going to get into it tonight, but the Shidduchim system is, is, is part of it. I just wish everyone could borrow my phone for one day and you would get calls from every kind of family, and you would realize that every family has problems. And then nobody would have to pressure their family about Shidduchim anymore because you'd realize <laughs> there's two kinds of people in this world. There's normal people and people that you really know. Once you get to know any family, you find out, okay, they're messed up just like us. <sighs> so here's the bottom line. Unconditional love is not enough. We got to go to unconditional pride. And that unconditional love and pride that a parent has for a child is the most powerful tool that any human being has in any relationship with any other human being. And yet, if you use it for that, if you use it to get a result, then it's not unconditional. So you got to love them as they are right now. How do you love them and be proud of them? How do you love them and be proud of them as they are right now? Be a Rebbe, see their neshama. Their infinite neshama, which has eternal intrinsic value and doesn't have to earn anyone's approval. A neshama which already has Hashem's pride. If Hashem's proud of them, how dare you not be proud of them? That's it. That's the whole sugya in, uh, in a nutshell. I'm going uh, to look at the chats and the q and I'm going to see what we've got over here. Um, first question here. If a, child, if a parent invites a child to this series, how can that be done without implying the child is on a certain path? Um, <laughs> Well, why do you want your uh, why do you want your child to come to this uh, webinar? What do you want them to hear? Let me tell you something. Whatever they need to hear is going to be so much more powerful if they hear it from you. They don't need to come on Chase Taub's webinar. They need for their mother or father to bond with them. Bonding, let me tell you something. Bonding is a simple thing. It means spending time with somebody, doing things that they enjoy, talking about what they like to talk about. If they like video games, play video games. If they like to learn Torah, learn Torah with them. Some children like to learn Torah. By the way, even some children who are not religious like to learn Torah. And if they like it, then learn it with them. 
If they like to play Frisbee, play, play Frisbee with them. If they like to cook in the kitchen, then cook with them. If they like to just sit around and, uh, and talk, then sit around and talk. They don't need this webinar. They need you. Okay, let me go to the next uh, question. Uh, hold on, how do I close this to show that I answered it already? I'm dismissing it because I, okay. My child needs therapy, but won't go. Please help. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you something. A lot of children do need therapy. But like I told you at the very beginning, what a thousand professionals can do for your child will never amount to what you can do for them. So I would say like this. Increase your bond with your child until they trust you enough that they want to hear your opinion on whether or not they should go to therapy. I don't know of a shortcut. I don't know of a shortcut. Maybe there is one. I don't know of it. You know what a best friend is? Somebody who you really trust, somebody who you can tell anything to, and you know that, you know, I once saw a refrigerator magnet. It said, a, a best friend is somebody who's seen you at your worst and still thinks you're the best. Our children deserve to have somebody like that in their lives. Are you willing to be that person in your children's lives? So when they know that they have total acceptance and trust and that we have their best interests at heart. Not that we're nudging them for some other reason, but because we just love them. Then they look at us like a best friend and people say, oh, your child's not supposed to be your friend. Yeah, that's right. You're, sp you're supposed to be your child's friend. Why did nobody ever figure that out? Of course, your child's not your friend. You're not supposed to get your emotional needs met through your child. That's awful but you're supposed to be your child's friend. That means when your child needs emotional support, they should look to you first. And I want to tell you something, not to scare you, but if your child isn't looking to you for emotional support, where are they looking? And whose values are they picking up when they're looking to other people for emotional support? And these people who are giving them emotional support, are they doing so altruistically or are they using your child? I don't know how many times I've seen children fall into relationships where they're being exploited just because they needed somebody older and respectable who they felt they could rely on. And they didn't feel they had that at home. They didn't feel they had anyone at home they could rely on. So increase the level of trust. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, my, I'm not my child's friend. Then what are you? They're not your friend. You don't need their emotional support, but they need your emotional support. Yeah, you have to be their friend, their advocate, their champion. Of course. Of course. Let me continue on the Q&A. What about boundaries? I think we spoke about that. All right? We spoke about boundaries. Should I repeat what I said? My boundaries. Um, boundaries are for you to not be a codependent. See, it's funny. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about boundaries. When I make a boundary, the boundary is not for you. The boundary is for me. Like, <laughs> let's say I'm dealing with someone like you know, like an addict. The, a boundary isn't. You have to be home at eleven. That's not a boundary. That's that's an ultimatum. Ultimatums are the, the, all part of the, the disease of being a codependent. A boundary is, I'm going to bed at 11 p.m. I'm not staying up all night. I'm going to bed at 11 p.m. And I'm locking the door, right? So that's a boundary. A boundary isn't me telling you what you got to do. A boundary is me telling me what I'm going to do. Because I have enough dignity and self-control to make rules for myself. Those are boundaries. Those are boundaries. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret about boundaries. 
that when we are still recovering from codependency, we need a lot more boundaries for ourselves because when we don't have them, we end up trying to control people. We end up using um, the relationship to try to get results. So, you know, it's like we try to guilt them, we try to sweet talk them, you know, man manipulative behavior. But as you become more God-reliant and less person-reliant, and you don't look to your child or to any human being to give you peace of mind because you just have peace of mind from Hashem. So you actually, it's, it, it becomes safer and safer to just be there for people and give to them. And, 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 and you don't need so many boundaries for yourself. But when I'm still you know, manipulative and I'm still trying to use people, then I need more boundaries. So I need to tell myself, I don't care if you stay out all night, I'm going to bed at 11 p.m. But after a while, when, when my peace of mind comes directly from Hashem, I don't even have to make that boundary. But yeah, the, the boundaries are not what you put on other people. That, that's ridiculous. That's just more controlling. That's what the unrecovered codependents uh, say in order to you know, sound like they're talking recovery. They say, so I, I made a boundary. Yeah, who's, who's boundary? But putting a boundary on someone else, that's not a boundary. Boundary is what I put on myself to preserve my own sanity. But uh, once you're not controlling people, and that takes a lot of faith because you have to believe Hashem is taking care of the people you love and now you don't have to control them. Uh, but once you have a lot of faith, you're not controlling people anymore. So uh, you don't, uh, you're not trying to, to leverage them for a peace of mind anymore. There's a lot more uh, giving that can happen. And, uh, you know, giving is what it's all about. At the end of the day, you know, giving was never the problem. I said that before, but I'll say it again. Giving was never the problem. It was that we were using giving in a, in a, in a manipulative way. But once you realize that, you know, everybody is the way they need to be right now, and I don't have to try to change you. Now I can give, and there's no, no toxicity there. To the contrary, it's only, it's only very healing. Okay, let's let's try to do some more Q and A. I love this; it's so true. <laughs> okay, I won't I won't disagree with that. All right. My house is tumbling, one child after another opting out. Okay, okay. All right, well, so I want to address that. I don't know if this is what you're saying, but I've heard this a lot, parents who are saying, look, I should have the first kid, first kid who, who started, uh, you know, down the slippery slope, I should have cut him off, I should have just thrown him out, said Shiva, that's it, because I, I, I let him stick around, and the other kids picked up the bad habits, and, and the whole house fell apart. I hear that a lot. And I want to tell you something. For, for a long time, I even thought that argument sounded logical. I knew somehow it wasn't true. And how did I know it's not true? Because people don't become fry by exposure to fry people. <laughs> that's, not, <laughs> that's not what happens. Um, you know, if, 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 for instance, you know, if, if, you're, if you're the shliach and you move to, uh, you know, wherever to, uh, to be makad of people, so you're the ambassador, right? You're not going to defect and join that country. You, rep you represent the country that you're the ambassador for. In fact, it'll, it'll strengthen you, Yiddish guy, right? So, and, and we see this with the families where they have a child who's not from right now, but the from children are taught obviously Israel. It, it's uh, it's amazing the chinuch. I mean, nobody should be in a position to have to teach this to their children. But when they are in that situation, the chinuch that the children get from seeing the love and the acceptance that the parents have for the not currently from child is, is is amazing. Also, I mean, on so many levels, on so many levels, it just produces such edelkeit and, and sincerity. Okay, but let me put that aside for a second. Um, or maybe put it aside entirely till, till another time. Okay, that's a whole other discussion. Um, 
the argument that, you know, we should have cut the kid off because I see the house is tumbling, like the questioner phrased it, the house is tumbling. Um, I knew something wasn't right about the argument that the younger kids picked it up from the older kids. And then one day, it clicked for me because somebody explained to me um, a real life scenario. And all of a sudden I understood what was happening. One by one, each kid leaves Yiddishkeit. It's not because they got it from each other. It's because they were all exposed to the same trauma. If everybody in a house gets food poisoning, do you say they caught it from each other? Or do you say they must have all eaten the day-old tuna salad? Siblings don't become weak in Yiddishkeit because they saw an older sibling being weak in Yiddishkeit. Unfortunately, what usually is the case is that all the siblings were exposed to the same trauma. Now, what does that mean? I mean, I mean, everyone's thinking this, so I'll just confirm it. If, if, if you're thinking, wow, that one child was sexually abused and it was the same perpetrator who abused all the children. Yeah, that's, that's one. I mean, I'm not saying that's always the case in most of the cases, but yeah, certainly that's a scenario. Certainly that's a scenario. Although it could be something as simple as there's incredible tension in the home. It's not a happy home. Emotionally, it's a, it's a dark home. And that's traumatizing. That's traumatizing. So what I want to say is if you see your children one by one, tumbling in Yiddishkeit. Look at the underlying causes. And first of all, first question is, what can I do to protect my child? Not protect them from frying out. That's not, that's a symptom, not the cause. To protect them from whatever hurt them. Now, if it's something that happened to them, uh, if it's happening now, you, you, you have to find it out and stop it. If it happened already, what can you do other than Embrace them, embrace them, embrace them. Again, the, the first thing I said, this whole talk, I'll go back to it. The greatest medicine is the love of a parent. So if a child has had trauma, give them love, more love, double the love. And if the trauma was a lack of parental love, sometimes that's the, 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 the trauma itself is a lack of parental love, then for sure giving love is a remedy for that trauma. That's the best case scenario. You ruined them, you fix them. But I'm saying even in a case where somebody else ruined them, parental love can fix them. That's what I don't mean a person was ruined, but I mean that a person was given a terrible emotional burden. The love of a parent can ease that burden like nothing else. Okay, let me look at another question. I have a question. How can you watch your child not keep Shabbos when it isn't good for their soul? If you truly love your child, you must say something. Even the Alter Rebbe says to rebuke them if they're on the same level as you. What happens if they're on drugs? You wouldn't say anything either. You need to set limits with children. Okay. All right. If you care about your soul, if you care about their soul, then please don't be merachet them further and push them further into their numbing behaviors, which are probably not al -pitayra. Now, some people's numbing behaviors is that they sit and learn tasteless all day. You know, there are people that that's their numbing behavior. Um, and I guess that works out well because, you know, not only is it socially acceptable, but it's, it, it's a mitzvah, so that works out well. But if somebody is going through hell and you pressure them and reject them, you're just pushing them further into their numbing behaviors, which are probably not actions that are alpitaira. So if you really care about their soul, 
then, then do what every shliach and every Chabad house does. When, when the guy drives up on Friday night, jingling his keys and then talking on a cell phone and walks into your, into your house, you smile, oh, you're here, sit down and have some matzo ball soup because you care about their soul. Because you care about their soul. Now you use an example, well, they're doing drugs. Shouldn't you say something? No healthy person wants to ruin their life with drugs. So if they're ruining their life with drugs, that's a raya. They're not 100% healthy right now. So <laughs> if the only problem is, oh, heroin is bad. I didn't know that. Oh, thank you for telling me, right? But they do know it. They do know it. And they don't feel either that they're worthy of sobriety or that sobriety is tolerable. Because every time they feel everything that a sober person feels, they want to kill themselves. So you're going to take away their self-medication and, and do and, and, and what? They, they, should, they should go kill themselves? I, I'm, I'm not saying that flippantly. I'm saying literally. I'm saying literally. Somebody's only way of, of facing reality is to not face it. And you're going to take that away from them. And, and then God forbid. So. I, I don't think it's such a, it's like a, you make it sound like such a simple approach. Well, just have boundaries, just be tough, just tell them, cut it out, stop doing that, and then they'll stop. You're talking about somebody who's, a, who, 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 who's in incredible pain and is doing the best they can to manage. So don't add to their pain. If you care about them, then, then support them. And when they feel worthy and they feel like they, they, that, that their, their life is worth something, then you'll be able to help them to, uh, to implement the choices they're making to live a better life. But if somebody doesn't feel like they want to live a better life, yelling at them that they need to live a better life is not going to do anything. It's only just going to scare them and disappoint them and, and reject them more, and they'll go more into the numbing behavior. So please don't 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 tell me this that you know you have to have boundaries. So therefore, you're going to go nag and harass your child who is self-medicating. How do you explain the Mishnah, using love to be makar of someone, of rum feeding his guests to get them to say abracha? So Torah seems to support this method. Every shliach offers good food in an event as a hook to get someone to come learn Torah, etc. Okay. That's a good question. So first of all, why can't you read that to mean you want to be makad of somebody to Torah? Love them. That's the best way. That's the best way. Not if it wouldn't be for the fact that really I don't care about you. I only care about Torah. So I'm pretty, but because I care about Torah, I have to pretend to care about you. No, that's not what it's saying. <laughs> it's saying if, 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 if you really care about Torah, then you have to really care about the Jew. So love them. And that will be makar of them to Torah. Why can't that mean pshat? Now you say, okay, I have a, I have a story from Avram Avinu. He used to force people to bench. Okay, you know, Hanami, you have a nice story of Avram Avinu. And, uh, and that's true. And who is Avram Avinu dealing with? He was dealing with people who were completely ignorant of monotheism. They were Avdi Avedazara because that's all they knew. And uh, he was trying to explain it to them. And in order to explain to them, no, you really do need the Abish there. So he put him in a predicament where they couldn't pay the bill for the food at the Oasis. And he says, look, you have to admit, you can't pay for the food, right? So you can't do everything. So you are dependent on a power greater than yourself. Ah, and that's why you should match, right? So he was teaching that. But uh, our children know that already. They're not these... If they had a Zoro wandering the desert in the times of, uh, of, of, of Nimrod, <laughs> you sent them to Heder, you sent them to Yeshiva. They know these things. 
They know these things. And if you're going to use a tactic like Avraham Avinu to break down the ego a little bit, you're just pushing them further away because their egos are already broken. Avraham Avinu was dealing with people who were too arrogant and too ignorant to believe in God. Do you think our children are too arrogant and too ignorant? They have shattered self-esteem, so they're not too ignorant, they're not, not too arrogant. And they were sent to Cheder, so they're not ignorant. What they are is in pain. And by harassing them, you're only adding to the pain. And you said, what, how is this different than every, any Chabad house to give somebody chicken soup in order to get them to come to a shir? Please don't be made to laz and shlochim. Sometimes the mitzvah is just to get the Jew to eat the chicken soup. If you also learn Torah, that's also good. That's a second mitzvah. But if I can get a yid to sit at a Shabbos table and have Enoch Shabbos, even if he doesn't call it Enoch Shabbos, I already accomplished something. I'll tell you a story. I don't know if it's so Negea, but Gishmak Emaise. The Alta Rebbe's Chesidim, the Yustafa Breng, in a certain town, I don't remember which town they lived in, but one of the towns, not in Liyajna where the Alta Rebbe lived. So I'm in the Balatan, the Alta Rebbe of Chabad. So these chassidim, they used to febreng, and there was this one guy, he was a big balaveda, and he used to come sit with them at the febrengs. He liked febrengs. He was a shagitz, but he liked febrengs. So the misnagdim were harassing these chassidim. Ah, you see, you guys are also this way, and that's why this guy hangs out with you. So they went to the Alter Rebbe. They knew they had to tell the Alter Rebbe first. They couldn't do it, you know, on their own. But that's atzme. They told the Alter Rebbe, we have this guy, he's, we got to get rid of him because he's, you know, giving a bad name to the Chassid. And the Alter Rebbe says, well, what does the guy do? No, he sits at the Fabreng. Yeah, well, what does he do at the Fabreng? No, no, he sits there. It's what he does right before the Fabreng and what he does right after the Fabreng. Does, you know, it's a big balavator. So the Alter Rebbe says, Oy, if you had any concept how much time it is greater than my life, Every second that a yid just doesn't do an Aveda, you wouldn't even ask me this question. You're telling me that before the Fabrengen and after the Fabrengen, he's doing Avedas. So th th that, th and therefore, you want to chase him away from the Fabrengen. So the child was in his room all Shabbos watching porn on the smartphone and comes out, wanders out for five minutes. And may, just may, if you smile lovingly and sincerely enough, sit down at your Shabbos table without a yarmulke and just have Einig Shabbos, even if he doesn't call it Einig Shabbos, but just have a pleasant moment at a Shabbos table. No, that's not enough. No, get back into your room. Go back to the porn. Go back to the smartphone. I know that's not what you're saying, but by crinkling your nose at him, that's, that's what you're sending him to. You're sending him to his numbing behaviors. Okay, let, let's. I, the question <laughs> I feel like the Eden in Mitzray in building the cities on swamps because I've seen how many questions are on my list of questions. The number's been at 18 all night, <laughs> and I've answered five or six of them already, and it just keeps, go, it keeps going up. I'm not sure what to do here, and I haven't even looked at the chat, but uh, let me. Let me let me look here. I try to love each one, but I believe that each one impacts the next. I might be the worst parent in the world, but what to do? Yeah. Okay. So I said that it's not that they impact the next. Please don't, 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 don't buy into that. Okay. I'll tell you what impacts each child. When each child sees that you love them as they are right now, they breathe. They breathe. See, when a child lives in a house and wonders if his own parents even really want him there, they can't breathe. You know what pressure that is to know that you're an unwanted guest in somebody's home and you have nowhere to go? When they see that you're loving and you're relaxed and you're having a good time with their siblings, then they breathe also because they know that you feel that way about your children. Enjoy your children. Enjoy them. Let them get 
come, let them come back to living. Let them come back to life. If you believe Toyota is so true, and I do too, I also believe Toyota is true, then believe that when your children are fully healthy, functioning adults, they will come to the truth. But they have to become fully healthy and functioning. Let's, uh, okay. Similarly, the Ramam talks about giving kids treats to get them to do good until they can do it lishma. Okay, similarly to what? It was a follow-up, I guess, on another question. Okay. Oh, you're saying similar to what I'm saying? That you uh, you be nice to them in order to... to... I'm not sure. Okay. Anyways, let's. Uh, I'm going to move on. I'm not a big uh, fan of, uh, of bribery. I, I don't like threats and I don't like bribery. In some ways, I don't like bribery even worse than I don't like threats. It, it's all, it's all conditions. But uh, whatever, we can get into that. We can have that discussion another time. Whether children uh, need bribery, I know. I know, I know the Rambam. Okay. Anyways, let, let's. Is it possible to get the recording? Yes, uh, we will have a recording. Okay. Can you please speak about kids off the derech dating non-Jews? Oi. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about it. Uh, you know, there was a time, there was a time when it was much easier to stop an intermarriage because basically what it was, the person didn't understand how bad it was or they forgot how bad it was. And you had to do something to get through to them. You know, so the rabbis would take the young man, open up the oran and say, take the Sefer Torah and throw it on the floor. Because if you marry that non-Jew, that's what you're doing. You're throwing the Sefer Torah on the floor. I, I know Rabbanan back in the 50s, the 60s, even the 70s, that, that stuff used to work. Because what was lacking is a person had a chsar in, 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 in Yedia. They didn't understand or they didn't properly understand. But you had to get through to them so they would understand. But our kids, when, when they come to that point where they don't even care whether they date a Jew or marry a Jew, it's not a lack of knowledge. It's that they're, they're in such pain. They just want distraction. They just want relief. Why shouldn't I have some relief? Why shouldn't I have something that makes me feel good? So as hard as this is to say, when, when a child is involved in a, a, real, a relationship with a non-Jew, that is a child who needs twice as much love and support, a hundred times as much love and support. And we believe that if we can give them that love, parental love, don't make them get it from somewhere else. If we can genuinely give them that parental love, and again, unconditionally. So that doesn't mean I'm loving you so that you will break up with that non-Jew. No. I know this is very difficult to do. But to put yourself into the position where you can actually say to yourself sincerely, I'm loving you so much, I couldn't love you any more or any less. And it has nothing to do with who you date, who you marry. That can't affect it. I couldn't love you more if you marry Jewish. Couldn't love you less if you marry non-Jewish, God forbid. I know that's very, it's a gargantuan task. Gargantuan task. But if you can do it, then that is the best possible path that a, that a child will have to making a choice that's healthier for their neshama. So yeah, there are parents who have done the real mesidus nefesh of doing what, you know, someone mentioned the Chabad house, a shliach, you know, you have the intermarried person to your house and you be nice to the non-Jewish spouse, right? Because it's not their fault. They're not bad. They, they're, 
they're innocent. They got dragged into this unawares, right? And you're, you're friendly and you're smooth. You say, well, they don't know any better. So this is even more so. Your child does know better and they're still doing it. Why are they doing it? I promise you, it's not from a place of, uh, of emotional strength. And I know I'm going to get hell for saying that too, because there are people who are going to feel offended and they're going to say, well, I left Yiddishkeit and I married a non-Jew and it has nothing to do with the lack of emotional strength. And I would ask those people, would you say that the environment you grew up in, your family and your community was nurturing or not? That's all I would ask. That's all I would ask. Okay. Anyways, let me, let me just continue. I want to try to knock off all these questions. How can parents practically work at getting this perspective? How can the teachers and principals receive this blessed perspective? Thank you for calling it blessed. Appreciate that. Um, how can parents, how can parents get this? This is Yiddish guy. I want to tell you something. This isn't um, a special sugya for Nebach people whose kids went OTD. No, this is the real Yiddishkeit. It's just most people have the luxury of never doing it. The real Yiddishkeit is Yisrael Reis of Akutche Bricho Kolachat. The Yidin Tayyan and Abish there are one thing. The real Yiddishkeit is the preciousness of Yidin. And that that, that Avas Hashem, Avas Atayra, and Avas Yisrael are one Ava. That's the real Yiddishkeit. Most people have the luxury of not having, not being forced into a situation to come to such a level of Avas Yisrael. But people who are going through this parasha, so they are put into that position where ultimately to have the proper Avas Hashem and Avas Atayra, they have to have Unhuman levels of Avas Yisro. But you can accomplish unhuman levels of Avas Yisro because it's coming from the Neshama. And the Neshama is infinite. So that's how we get the perspective. I mean, this, this is Yiddishkeit. And this is in everything in Torah. Everywhere you look in Torah. Now, you'll see what you want to see. If you want to see uh, threats and punishment, then th that's what you'll see. But if you want to see love, that's what you'll see. I hope that you'll look for the love, for the benefit, for, 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 for the benefit of all of us. The benefit of all of us. Okay, I, I'm going to continue quickly. We need training hands-on. Okay. Um, I don't know what to say, you know. First of all, I, I, I don't go around giving uh, references to people because whatever that that implies a certain level of, of responsibility but i will mention that you know um there's a there's a shabbaton called kesha nafshi which i think now they do twice a year i've been there in the past it's only a weekend okay but you want hands-on training go, go to the kesha nafshi shabbaton there you go that's a Hands-on training, okay. Um, at the same time, I'm more looking at myself rather than my children and to refine myself. Good, okay, I agree with that. I agree with that. Okay, should you stress this to a child that is not having issues or is it better that they feel you want them to succeed and that you will make, that, and that will make you proud? Ooh, that is great. I like that question. So I wanna tell you something. Um, you want to hear from me what I say? I say that if this stuff is true, then it's true for all of us. That's what I say. I know some people will say that this is a like special dispensation when the kid needs the emergency treatment. But I say no. If this really is real Yiddishkeit, like I was just saying it was, then it applies to all of us. And all of us need love and acceptance. And here's the thing. We're so used to thinking that excellence can only emerge from pain and strife that we assume that if you won't have pain and strife, you won't be excellent. And that's so silly. 
that's such a silly concept. And, and I've heard people argue this and they talk about tiger mom, which <laughs> I've heard from people say, you gotta be a tiger mom. A tiger mom is not a Jewish thing, right? <sighs> Believe in the neshama. Believe in the mice yadai lihispoi. That every Jew is the handiwork of Hashem that he is proud of. When you can be proud of every Jew, they will rise to the occasion. They will rise to the occasion. They don't need pushing. I believe this applies to all of us. I want to be treated this way. I want to treat you this way. I want our teachers to treat all of our students this way. I don't think it can go wrong with, with, with love and pride and, and, and acceptance and kirov. I think it brings out the best in all of us. And if you think that, well, if no one's being mean to me and harassing me, why would I even try? <laughs> that itself is the voice of trauma. That itself is the voice of trauma. The only reason anyone would try is because they're being, uh, because love is being withheld. Sorry, it's not compelling to me. Okay. But with the attitude of just love and not much kvoda, uh, that's how we lose touch. And the children will do less and, and less. And so no more Jews. No more Jews. Like, what? Are we no more Jews? Like, are we no more Jewish people? Um, okay. So you can harass everybody. And eventually there will be a minion of Mitzayonim, and that will be the Jewish people. Well, you can try that. All I can say is like this. The people who are writing this and are saying, you have to be harsh. You have to be gvuridic. I'm, I'm just praying that these are people who came on stam out of curiosity and, and not that they have children in this parsha. Because I can tell you that if this is the way you're thinking, your child feels it and your child wants to die. Because any human being who knows that the people who made you, that the parents who made you, look down on you. That feeling is so deeply, deeply painful to the core that a person who feels that doesn't even want to exist. Maybe they'll save their lives and not want to die by deciding that they hate you instead of hating themselves. And that's how some of these children save their lives. They decide to hate their parents instead of hating themselves. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want that for you either, though. I don't want your child to hate himself, and I don't want your child to hate you. Let me let me. I have eleven questions left. Here. What do you do about a child who has tattoos and isn't always careful about hiding them? Why should they hide them? They have them. I don't know. Okay, he hasn't worn shorts in the neighborhood since he got his first one, but he wears short sleeves, and the one on his arm is visible. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I'll tell you the thing about tattoos is that, you know, if a person is mechal shabbos. You don't see that on Tuesday. If a person ate today, if, after he gets up from the restaurant and you walk, turns the corner, you don't see where he was eating. A person who gets tattoos, it's, it's look, it's a lav. I mean, like like other lavin, but unfortunately, it's one of these things that just you see it on the person all the time. So there's, because of that, there's a certain emotional. Uh, yeah, understandably, a certain emotional reaction to it. But here, here's what I want to tell you. If your child wants to hide it, let him hide it. Maybe he regrets it, okay? But uh, you shouldn't think that you're telling him to hide it. You shouldn't think that, that you need him to hide it. And in fact... 
if your child wears shorts and has tattoos and comes visits you, I think the greatest thing you can do for their Yiddish guy, go take a walk around the block, go spazier on Shabbos with, with your son with the, with the shorts and the tattoos. And, 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 and don't tell him to put on a yarmulke. Now, if he wants to put on one, you don't have to tell him to take it off. <laughs> Obviously, we're not against mitzvahs. But you go take a walk around the block with him on Shabbos and just enjoy his time. Just enjoy his time. I'm telling you, it's the greatest thing that you can do for him. If you really care about his neshama, I'm saying, it's the greatest thing. Give him 15 minutes of parental love. Walk around the block together with a parent. And, and, and I promise you something, you don't have to say this. In fact, don't say it. But he'll know that when you walk around the block with him, you listen to me right now, okay? When you walk around the block with your child with the shorts and the tattoos, all the bad feelings that he has, every time that one of the neighbors looked down at him since he was a kid, since he didn't fit in, and they looked down at him, every disapproving look that a mechanic gave and that a neighbor gave, any disapproving look that anyone ever gave that made him feel less than, you go walk around the block with him on Shabbos when looking the way he's looking right now. And at least for those 15 minutes, that will all go away. And he will feel as perfect and loved as his neshama. If you want to give that for your child. If you want to give that to your child. Otherwise, okay, I'm not here to threaten you. But your child will find people who are proud to walk around the block with him in his shorts and his tattoos. Why can't his mother and father walk around proudly with him on Shabbos? When you do that, that is the most powerful medicine. You can hire a thousand professionals. They cannot provide that level of healing. Why would you not give the medicine to your child that you're the only one who has it? How about respect for house rules? There are other children in the home. <sighs> yeah. You know what? I, I believe in house standards, not house rules. Um, this may be as controversial, but... Uh, if my children respect me and my house, they will, they'll act accordingly. And um, by being a tyrant and demanding adherence, I'm not gaining anything. You know, cops go around pulling people over for speeding. You know what that teaches them? Slow down when you see a cop. <laughs> it doesn't make people not speed. So, if I catch you not being sneers, I'll make you go change, right? It doesn't make you sneers, Dick. In fact, if I make you go change, then when you're not where I can see you, you know, the minute you go to uh, Eretz Yisrael, you know, the shorts come out. I mean, the mice in Bechol Look. You want your children to live according to house rules. You want your children to live according to your standards. Then make your child feel like part of the family. Let them know this is their tribe. When they identify with you, they will identify with your values. I promise you. When they identify with you, they will identify with your values. The problem isn't getting them to follow your values. The problem is getting them to identify with you. If they identify with you, automatically they will follow your values. They know what your values are. They know what your values are. And by the way, let me ask you a question. If you have a kid who's from, and he's not Michal Shabbos, is he not Michal Shabbos because that's a house rule? Tell me that. He's not Michal Shabbos because it's a house rule? Or because he doesn't want to be Michal Shabbos? Because that's a sensitivity that he has. So you know when your children who, who are keeping the mitzvahs that they're keeping, it's not because it was a house rule, it's because they internalized that value. 
Okay, so do the same thing with the child who's not yet keeping that mitzvah. Allow them to internalize it as a value. House rules. What are house rules? You know what? I only know one house rule. The Kal Godel Batoira. The biggest rule in Torah, the rule for all other mitzvahs. The Kal Godel Batoira. That's our only Kal. That's our rule. That's our rule. You want to have a house rule? Our rule is be like the Balshamtiv's parents. That when Elio Novi came and acted like a Machal Shabbos, and it was boisterous, and he drew attention to himself. He tried to get himself thrown out. And the Balshamta's father, Rebbe Lezer, he wouldn't throw out the guy, right? He wouldn't throw him out. And the, the, the guests were looking down at him, and, and Rebbe Lezer went to the, to, to the other room, and he was crying because he felt so bad for this guest, and he was mekat of that guest. And then afterwards, he says, I'm Ilyon Novi, and now you're going to have a son, the Balshamta. You want to have a son, the Balshamta? So you have to be mekat of every year. Now we're going to take it to the next level. You want to have a son of Baal You have to be makar of your son when your son is that yid that Ilya Novi was pretending to be. Can you mention the five types of love? I know gifts, words. Can you explain all five types? Thank you. Okay. So I think you're talking about like five love languages. It's funny. If people assume that I know all these secular things. I really don't. But yeah, I've heard of this five love languages. Um, I don't know. I never read the book and I don't know what the five love languages are. But just listen, it's, it's posh. It. It's posh. It. You want to make somebody feel good about you. You want to you know, relax them. You want to make them feel appreciated. So there's like different ways of, of doing that. Some people like to, to talk. Some people don't like to talk. Some people like to just sit in your presence quietly. Other people like to go out and do things together, uh, you know, spending time together. Other people, you get them a gift. Oh, I was out at the store and I saw some paprika and I knew that you needed paprika and I bought you the paprika. You know, like, right? Uh, some, some people, oh, oh, physical touch, huge thing. Do you hug your kids? 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 I'm asking you a simple question. Do you hug your kids? Your kid who isn't from right now, when's the last time you hugged him? Well, he doesn't want to hug. No, not from you, because the relationship turned toxic. But show him it's safe. Show him you're a safe person. Show him you're a trustworthy person so that he can actually experience the hug from you. And that hug is more healing than anything. Let's keep going. I want to finish up. How do we deal with teenagers who are slacking off from school and are just lazy? Uh, if you forgive me, I think I'm just going to skip that because, it, okay, if they're just lazy, they're just lazy. All right. But uh, So that's outside of the scope here. I think a lot of kids who have deeper problems are accused of being lazy. But anyways, okay. Meeting your non-Jewish boyfriend and girlfriend. I think we spoke about that. Um, okay. Is reminding a child older than 30 to make a bracha okay because after all they'll be getting married soon and you certainly want them to do this basic too. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry for laughing. That's not right. I shouldn't laugh. <sighs> because they'll be getting married soon, you should remind them to make a bracha. How about reverse? Because they'll be getting married soon, they're way too old for you to remind them to make a bracha. <sighs> a three-year-old needs to be reminded to make a bracha. If a 30-year-old's not making brachas, they don't need to be reminded to make brachas. <sighs> Look, guys, so many of this, um, so much of this, like so many of these questions, really is push it simple emotional intelligence. And by the way, if you're out there and you're saying, but I do love my kid, my kid loves me, and I hug my kid, and we bond, and we spend time together, and he's still not from, I'm going to tell you, you're awesome. Keep it up. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't give up. And the most important thing is don't listen to the naysayers who make you feel like a sucker because they tell you to not enjoy your child, and then it takes one disapproving comment, and, and you knock the kid off the rails. For, for, for weeks, for months. Don't listen to those people. If you have a good relationship with your kid, your kid's still not from, don't stop. Keep it up. Keep it up. 
What if it's a spouse that's causing it? <sighs> that's another story. I mean, we, 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 this was about uh, children who are off uh, the derech, so to speak. I don't like that expression, but you're asking about adults. I'll just say a quick comment about that. Quick comment. I hope this will be understood. You know how I said there's nothing more powerful than the love of a parent to a child and that a parent has a special ability to, to heal a child. Michal hein shemei alav. That is unique to a parent-child relationship. And I do not believe that a spouse can do that for another spouse. I don't believe that if you would just have more unconditional love and unconditional pride, that that can um, cure it. I think it's a different parsha. It's a different discussion. And uh, I don't want to get off into that subject, but I see a lot of times... Um, a lot of self-denial that happens, a lot of people compromising their own dignity and their own safety for a spouse who is not able to live as a responsible adult. Um, but that's not the topic tonight, okay? The topic is parents and children. Let's, let's stick with that topic. No matter how old your child is, a parent has a very special kaya, a unique kaya. Okay, let's, let's continue. How is it fair that Hashem puts people in situations that existence is painful? Um, how is it fair? I don't know. I don't know if it's fair. I, I don't know. You want me to tell you that in another Gilgal they did something? I don't know. But I do know that there are such people now, I can tell you, this doesn't make it fair, but I can tell you there is a bright side of it. I can tell you there's a silver lining. These extra sensitive people, these people for whom existence itself is painful, these are the most powerful people we have. These people who don't fit in anywhere, always feeling lonely in a crowded room, terminally unique, you know, the sensitive souls, so powerful. And if we nurture them and support them, they become our healers. And they, they, they're the ones who are leading the charge to make our community and our world the way that it needs to be. So does it, does, is that fair? Does it make it all right that Hashem makes some people so sensitive that existence is painful. Um, I don't know if it's fair. I don't know if that makes it all right, but I will tell you that these same people who are so sensitive and have so much pain are the, the most powerful healers. And I want to tell you something. It's nobody's business what somebody's story is, but I promise you, anybody you know who you think really gets it, who's really compassionate, if they're not bluffing, and you'll find out after a while who's real and who's not real, I promise you that there's somebody who's been through pain and perhaps even is still going through pain or maybe existence itself is painful for them. So is that fair? Does it make it all right? I don't know, but I do know that those who have pain end up being so powerful and having such a gift to share. You know, if we can stop being merachic, these sensitive souls, they can do so much for us. We need them. They're not the stragglers. They're not the weak link. They're, they're, they're supposed to be our leaders when we kick them out. They were supposed to be our gedolim and we kicked them out. You don't know the, the, the great leaders 
that, that we were supposed to have. And we need to become more compassionate as a culture. I'm not here to figure out how it happened. Was it Holocaust trauma? Uh, it's not my business. I, I don't care how it happened. We as a culture, I'm talking about from people, need to become more loving and gentle toward each other. And stop crippling people with the constant, relentless pressure of being judged. It's just too much. It's strangling. Even the people who, are, who, who survive and are able to make it, quote unquote, make it, they also hate it. Enough. We have a whole culture that's acting like a junior high lunch table. I mean, and, and, it, it, it's such a chil It's certainly not Toyota that told us to be this way. Just don't say this is Toyota. Don't, don't do this in the name of Toyota. Let's, let's finish here. But how do we communicate to our kids that their actions are not proper, like intermarriage? Should we not state that we love them, but yet we don't approve of their life choices? They know you don't approve, okay? They know you don't approve. On behalf of all Jewish people, thank you, okay? On behalf of me, thank you. Um, do I accept the guy if my daughter is dating and invite him to our home against our will? Well, what do you mean accept him? First of all, he's not doing anything wrong. He, it's not his fault. He got wrapped up in it. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But I will say that if you can show her love, even in this situation, even in the presence of that non-Jewish boyfriend, that love is so powerful and so healing that um, so good for the soul. I don't know why you wouldn't give it to your child. That's all I'll say about that. Okay. You are doing what not one rabbi is doing now. No, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. There are many rabbis who are doing this. I'm not the only one. It's not true. But thank you. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm glad you think I'm, you know, uniquely uh, whatever. But okay. This may be your most heartfelt talk ever. Okay. Did you see all my talks? <laughs> you think this is the most heartfelt? Oh, I think some others are more heartfelt. Uh, who can judge what's heartfelt? Yes, but I do take the situation very seriously. And it's also a little bit of fatigue. I'm just tired. I'm just, you know, if you see me getting emotional, I'm just worn down because it's like, I can't give your child the thing they need. The one, nobody can give your child the thing they need. They, the thing they need is, is you. They need you. They need you to be fully present. And again, I told you, you have to be a rabbi. You have to see the neshama and not get fooled or distracted. Not get pulled in by the chetzenias. So I got four questions left. I thought I had no more tears, but the beauty of your words and true obviously Israel brings tears to my eyes. Keep up the good work, please. Okay. Uh, you know what? When somebody says, I thought I had no more tears, you know what that means. You know what to say. Talking about somebody who cried a lot. Okay, but hopefully these are different tears. This is not tears of pain. This is tears of hearing, hearing truth. And uh, look, I want to make it clear here. My words moved you to tears. Great. It's not like I'm so smart or so special. This is posh. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That's it. Okay? It doesn't take a genius to, to, to say this. Okay? Maybe, in fact, maybe I'm an idiot for saying it. Maybe I'm... I don't know. I don't know what the, 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 the fallout will be for, for saying that. I don't know who, who's going to judge this. Everyone judges. You know what? 
It's pikuach nefesh. There, there are children dying. And, and we can't afford to be part of the problem anymore. I cannot afford to be part of the problem. I have a platform. Okay, I'm using my platform this way. You use your platform this way. Everyone has a platform. You dive in, in a shul, you sit at a table. There are other people who sit with you. Okay, so model compassion for them. Model compassion for them. We need to change our culture. This is the most powerful webinar. Thank you. I've grown children, and thank God you gave me this advice. You gave me this advice two years ago. Oh, okay, wow. Okay, you gave me this advice two years ago when my son came home with a non-Jewish girl. We do have a great relationship. It was a long, sad journey, but my family argues that he doesn't think it even bothers us because we allow them to come to our home, and we're so accepting. It's a tough call because I do forget to be upset sometimes. Oh, you're such a terrible person. Sometimes you forget to be upset. Look, we all know intermarriage is a tragedy. We all know Chil Shabbos is a tragedy. We all know that eating before Maidav is a tragedy. Anyone who's over under Tzene shall a Kalish Baruch, even a Diktu Kal shall Divre Sofra. It's a tragedy. These are tragedies. Someone's Mevatul Talmud Taira for one minute. It's a tragedy. But what do you want us to do? Go around being in pain every second from the Avedas that we're all doing? So we're all in pain and nobody can give you the one smile that you need to give you a path back home. So yeah, you know, I think about real tzaddikim, real tzaddikim, who were more sensitive to this stuff than we are. And trust me, when they saw a yid who had a, a, a smell of Avedas on him, it, it, it was more repulsive to them than we can imagine. And yet, they were not merachik, they were makarif. <sighs> yeah, Yiddish kind is serious, halacha is serious. Yeah, we want every Yid to be nizer uh, and tariq mitzvahs and, 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 and all the halachas midarabonin and uh, Minhogim, and of course, but if you want to be from, be from like Meish Rabbeinu. Meish Rabbeinu said, Mecheni no mesifrecha. I put my people first. I put my people first. And, and, and that's coming from Meish. Nobody cares about Teira more than Meish, for whom Teira, the whole Teira is called Teira's Meish. You want to be from, be truly from. Thank you for this life-changing shiur, okay? You're welcome. If so, it's comforting to know that probably Rav Shais himself has been through pain, has become so amazingly wise and passionate, etc. Yeah. Thank you. That Hey, that was very sweet of you. That was very sweet of you. Thank you for thinking about me. I appreciate it. You know, that's nice once in a while. Somebody actually thinks about me. I, I, I'm telling you, it feels good. Thank you. That gives me chizuk. It really does. Thank you. Okay. We're on the la Now I have 36 comments. I can't read the comments. I, I, I mean, I'm hoping all of you saw the comments because the comments were visible to everyone. And if you're watching this on replay, I know you can't see the, the, the comments. This, what can I do? And it was, I'm taking the last question. Maybe it's just a comment and I won't have to answer anything. It's going to take a lot for the parents that were brought up by the previous generation to make real changes. These are hardwired in and it leaves a lot of people speechless as to where to start with the awareness of this talk is a great start. Okay, so that was more, Hashem, more of a comment than a question. So I don't really have to answer it. Okay. Uh, this is two hours, over two hours. I want to stop now. And uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, you can do it. You can do it. If you're a parent, the Eivishter has given you a special kayach. You are Hashem's partner. There are three partners in a person. The mother, the father, and the Kaddish Baruch Hu. 
Hashem brought you in as a partner. A partner means you have full access to all of Hashem's resources. So that's it. You have infinite godly kayach. You can do it. And I know, and I know when, when, when it breaks your heart and you, and, and, and you just feel that pain and, and you want to, 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 to push the child away out of the sense of your own self-protection. I know you have to overcome it. You have to overcome that and be makarif. Be makarif. And you can do it. I know it's superhuman, but you can do it. The Abish is with you. The Abish is giving you kayak.